meeting this week at 6 p.m. Um, they'll be weaning outside in the 90 degree weather. Uh, and then of course, uh, next week we start a revival services with Brother Lynn. No? That was a bit postponed. Thank you. Okay, so no revival services next week. Uh, I was not aware of this, so thank you for letting me know. Um, if there's no other announcements, uh, we will continue worshiping as we listen to the prelude. Children's story. I'm sorry. All right. Well, we're gonna have a children's story. Uh, so 
Not on the screen. It's going to be on the screen? All right. stand for another hymn. Please. 
join me in singing on page 591, Give Up Your Best to the Master. Well, good morning, folks. Good morning. Are you still feeling blessed by the best? Yes, sir. Yep. Sometimes like these, we tend to start thinking about the things that are going on, and that can pretty much be a downer, and before you know it, we're walking around with a frown on our face. But, you know, if everything in this world goes against us, what Jesus has done for us tops that by, we don't have the numbers to say. So we welcome those of you who are here in person and those who might be watching online. We're thankful for all of you. And we pray that you're having a safe uh, July 4th holiday. Want to uh, lift a few people up in, in prayer. Uh, one was, um, and Jeanette said this morning, she said, go ahead and tell that Natalie 
is the one in their family, Lydia, I'm sorry, Lydia is the one in their family that is infected. Uh, although she's not sick at all, probably, maybe they thought maybe it's even a false positive. So they're in quarantine. Um, so we want to remember uh, them. We want to remember uh, Verna. Most of you know Verna uh, comes to this church sometimes. Uh, their pastor, Terry, uh, has um, the COVID. And he was in the hospital and out of the hospital and he's in and he's not doing very well right now. So she called and asked if we could put him on the list. And then Shirley, Shirley's been battling health problems for a while now. Uh, she's been in the hospital approximately two weeks. They were gonna do a procedure to put some stents in her arms, I think. And uh, they didn't do that. And she's gotten more and more down. And she told her girls, she's just ready to, to go. And uh, so they've been meeting with hospice and seeing what that will entail. Uh, but uh, I talked to Chris last night and Chris said that she's failing pretty quickly. Uh, those are the new ones. Um, I know the Clayton family, Mr. Rascal don't want to stay up there. <laughs> the Clayton family has been getting better. Uh, Ramon answered when I texted him and he said he was so thankful for the prayers. So keep the prayers uh, coming. There are some people that may be in quarantine that we don't even know about. And, um, you know, as, as far as this COVID thing is, I know it can be very, very serious, but I would hope that our faith can come in into it in some way. Now, do I mean like the rattlesnake guys that believe that if they believe hard enough, the rattlesnakes won't bite them? No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about doing the best you can, uh, doing whatever you think helps keep you safe and makes you safe, but then turn it over to God. Um, I've talked to a couple of people who said they are terrified of this, and, and I hate to see as Christians that we are terrified of anything. I don't feel we should have to be because, again, uh, this, you know, if, if we lose this life here on earth, if we are saved, no comparison, no comparison. Let's come to the Lord and pray. treading softly. When we went hunting, my dad would tell me, he said, you're never going to get a deer. I could hear you coming a mile away. So I guess I never learned to tread softly. But part of that softly is finding silence, finding times of silence. And uh, lots of times we don't do that. Lots of times we feel if something is too quiet, we got to turn some noise. And, and I, just, I say that, I mean, it could be good Christian music or whatever, but we need to fill that void with something. And we do, and, and I pray, Lord, that it would be good Christian music, it would be good Christian preaching and teaching, that it would be uh, Bible study and learning more about your word. And I just pray, pray that that's happening in all our families. Lord, uh, this has been a year, like I, I know people, I can remember pretty far now, uh, but I, people were remembering longer than me said they never saw anything like what we're going through now. So um, you aren't surprised by it, God. It was in your plan A um, that we're going to talk about long ago. And, uh, and, and you're not surprised, and you've got this. And that's what we got to remember, Lord. Again, certainly we don't go out and say, I'm going to walk down the street blindfolded and nobody will hit me. Uh, you know, people do crazy things like that. Uh, and that's, that's almost like tempting God to, to act. But uh, you will, like I, I like to say, it's not in the Bible necessarily, but if God brings you to it, he'll take you through it. Um, God doesn't give us more than we can handle. Wrong. That is altogether wrong. He doesn't let us be tempted more than we can stand, but uh, he's going to let us run up against things. If that wouldn't have happened, I would never be in ministry. I would have never been broken. So, Lord, you are amazing. Lord, we think of um, the people who are, are sick with COVID right now. 
uh, Lydia is not sick, so we're so glad about that. And we just pray that uh, she comes through this uh, in, a, in a good way. But Terry and uh, Shirley are sick, Lord, and they're very sick. And, and we lift them up to you. Uh, again, I had a talk with Shirley the other day, and she said she's ready. So that's what we'll go with. Um, and if indeed it's her time, Lord, we hope that you would take her quickly and, and painlessly, if that would be in your will. And uh, for Terry, Lord, uh, you know, he's a, a pastor, of course, and we just uh, pray for him. I know uh, his church depends on him. Um, and so we just pray that uh, that you would do, again, what's in your will. And I know there are pastors that die. We see it in the paper. Uh, so sometimes it is your will to bring us home, too. So, Lord, we think of all the things that are outside of our control. Help us to think of the things that are in our control, like coming to you, asking, you know, asking with, uh, uh, you know, like if you go to a, a prayer meeting to pray for rain, you take your umbrellas along, that kind of thing that we ask boldly and that we believe. Lord, we know that there are wild things going on in this country, and uh, I think I saw some monument got pulled down yesterday and thrown in the Potomac River or somewhere, something like that. And, you know, it's how, how can everybody be everywhere at once? We can't. Uh, but there certainly is, is a movement afloat to change who we are, and not that change is always bad, but I don't see this to be a, a change that is good. I've, I've not seen anything to show that yet. But again, we might be heading that way under uh, your protection, but you might say, you know what, I'm going to let them experience it. If they don't want to be with me, I'll let them experience what life is like without me. Uh, and, and you don't do that, God, to be condescending or to be cruel or anything. You just, um, you know, it's in the Bible in Romans. You, do, you just turn people over to their sinful lust and let them go. Uh, and that might be happening, and maybe that'll get the believers awake enough to uh, say, no, it's not going to happen. And, and to be bold, not to be out shooting at each other and stabbing each other and stuff, but and say, yeah, it's, that's not going to happen. Not, not now. So we, we give that to you. The police, I feel so bad for them, the police and the soldiers and all those that are, I mean, they're, they're trained, especially soldiers, to, to be in other country where there is a semblance anyway that some people are enemies. But here they are being called on to, to uh, actually have to fight. And with the protesters and some of the things that are going on there, it's just it's beyond, beyond reason, beyond anyone's ability to be that mean or to be able to take the meanness that's coming along. And that's why we see those outbursts from, from now and then. Uh, so Lord, there are also things that are on other people's hearts and we just lift, uh, give us a little bit of silence uh, to lift them up to you. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for who you are. We're thankful that you have men and women who have um, volunteered for the most part to look out for us. We thank you, Lord, there are men and women and, and there are whole families that are on the mission field who have said yes to you and, and uh, they are gonna do what, what you want uh, no matter what that does to their life. So we're thankful for that and we're just thankful, Lord, for all the good things that happen. Right now, it's so easy to pick out and list the things that are are not so swift, but uh, help us to see around that, to see through that, that we can be joyful always. Uh, we're not going to always like what's going on, but we can still find joy, joy in the Lord. So Lord, we just ask you to be with us as we continue to worship in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone 
the administration of this mercy or this mystery which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. Thank you, Jenny. Thank everyone who uh, helps make worship service possible. Um, we just give you thanks for all, all of that. What feeling comes to you when you hear the name Apostle Paul? Do you think of someone who was even a follower of Christ? Now, why in the world would I ask that question? Well, I don't know if you know or not, but they, there are a group of Paul haters out there. And unfortunately, some ministers are part of those groups. They say that Paul was arrogant. He was an imposter. After all, he wasn't one of the original 12. They say his words can't be trusted. They say he was really against Jesus Christ. And they spend very little time in his letters, even though book-wise, they make up over half of the New Testament. So why Paul? What was so special about him that Christ chose him? Let's pray. Lord, as I pray as we look at this, we can see some of the qualities that Paul had that, that you wanted. And I pray that we can see some of those qualities, either they're already in our lives or they are moving into our lives as we change to be more and more like you. Lord, if I have anything on here that shouldn't get out, uh, make me turn three pages, maybe. I don't know, whatever. It's yours because I've dedicated it to you, but anything that I put in you didn't want, just knock it out of there. But what you wanted us to hear, Lord, may it find soft hearts and may it find uh, legs and arms and, and uh, tongues that are ready to move and do your will in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we find out several things in verse 7. We find out that Paul was a, a servant of this gospel. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean uh, a slave. Uh, a servant would be more like an, an employee or someone who is working for something. Um, so as, as we look at that, it says that he is a servant of what? Of Jesus Christ? No, of Jesus Christ's gospel. Okay? And, and this gospel is what he is to be telling and it's it said it's it's by the gift of god's grace as jeff was talking about gift given me through the working of his power all right now when it says about being a servant being a slave to the word of god i think we get a good example of what that's like and i hinted about this last week that you aren't actually you know paul's talking about he's in in prison because of the of his ministry not that the ministry went out and handcuffed him or anything like that but jeremiah the weeping prophet uh he had a tough life as far as we know all through his life no one uh, was saved and uh he kind of thought fool you on this i'm not going to do it anymore and he says in jeremiah 29 he says but if i say forget it no more god messages from me he says, the words, the words of scripture are a fire in my belly, a burning in my bones. I am worn out trying to hold it in. I can't do it any longer. Now we're the other way, right? We got to twist each other's arms and push and shove to get us to talk about anything. But here the word of God wanted out so bad that he was almost sick if he couldn't deal with what God was wanting him to deal with. So I think that's really interesting. And it talks about, um, you know, trying to hold it in. What comes out of your mouth? I've told Nancy, I, I think I'm doing a little better because I would have said some unkind things to that person just pulled out and cut me off. 
Okay? So if I open my mouth there, that's what was going to come out. But how I wish when I open my mouth, God's words are ready to come out each and every time. And sometimes they're not. Uh, the gospel that he's talking about, of course, is the one uh, where we are all sinners and we take Christ's blood for our sin. He was buried, resurrected. He's Savior of all those who believe that, who believe that Christ is their Lord and have, um, you know, accepted him and, and done all that he asks us to do, to believe, to believe that he was resurrected. It's wonderful. Um, grace. We've talked about grace. And, and you think about, do you think Paul, you think it took any grace to use Saul and turn him into Paul? <laughs> what did he deserve? He's out there around enough Christians killing him, right? What did he deserve? Death. He deserved death. What did he get? Life. Wasn't the easiest life. The Lord told him early on, I'll show you some of the things you're going to have to suffer for me. And he did it anyway so Paul is not out seeking it if it's a gift now I guess maybe at Christmas time we might seek gifts or at, at um, our birthdays maybe we seek a gift but normally we're not seeking a gift and someone can really surprise you if they just give you a gift so Paul is not seeking it matter of fact he's against Christ he's rejected Christ he's actively persecuting Christians um, so he certainly doesn't get uh, grace because he earned it, but it's because the Lord shows how much he loves you and I through the way he loves Paul. Because his love is everlasting to everyone, everyone the same. So it took a lot of grace. And guess what? Romans 5.20 tells us, but where sin increases, grace increases all the more. Now that's another thing that kind of goes against uh, physics, right? The law of physics. If you have, you can only put so much in a container, and if you have uh, so much of this, then you can only have so much. And if you put more into this, you've got to put less into that. But if I understand all-wheel drive right on vehicles, I think to save gas, even though the wheels are, have the possibility of being four-wheel drive, they're just running freely. To save gas. But if you start slipping, what happens? The wheels kick in up front. And that's kind of, you know, Paul needed a lot of grace. So the, the sin increased. He was quite a sinner, like we all are. So the grace increased too. I think that's pretty awesome. Number one, only God's almighty grace and power can accomplish such a major change. Think about how Saul changed. You know, I never got the idea that he was a big person physically, but I think he was very bold, and I think his word was taken as gospel. If he said, go get that Christian, go kill that Christian, I think people did it without hesitation. Paul was, he said, uh, uh, you know, he was like leading the religious leaders and that whatever they knew and did, he knew more. And he wasn't saying that in a, in a, in a way that was trying to pull um, the message onto himself. He was just saying that because it was true. When he has that experience where he's blinded, instantly, as he's lying on the ground, he says, who are you, Lord? I, I don't think we, we grasp how angry he was and the power he had. And all of a sudden, he is, who are you, Lord? Okay? As he writes later on, there is coming a time when every knee shall bow on heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. So I think a drastic change happened in him right now. And that same power that it's talking about there in verse 7 is a power that turns the Roman Empire 
which we may as well say the known world at that time, upside down. And it continues. It continues when you and I treat someone that's treated us badly well. People say, how can they do that? How can they do that? Well, it's still God's turning everything upside down. So he turns the world upside down. He turns you and I inside out. He starts by working inside us. And to change our thoughts, to change our actions. And then finally, it starts being seen on the outside. All right. Grace and salvation lead to a life that is filled with God's power. And as I talked last week, why does he give us power? To do the things he's given us to do. So Paul, the one hated by millions, is used by the Lord to reveal these 16 mysteries. He's filled with the Lord to do God's kingdom's work. Not Christ's kingdom, but God's kingdom. And God works his power in the lives of those who will be an instrument. If, if Saul would have not changed, God would have never used him. Why would I say that? Well, he used Pharaoh because he knew Pharaoh wouldn't change. And, and he needed to show what would happen when we keep on saying no to God, no to God, no to God. He used Judas because he knew Judas would betray him. That wasn't something that happened and it's like, oh, wow, didn't see that coming. God did. So one of the things we, we need to do is be ready to serve. And a second is pliable. You know what that means? God can move us. He can twist us. He can, like, think of, of putty or, or uh, Play-Doh. What was that called? No, I forget. Play-Doh. Play-Doh. Stuff that when it's not hard, you can mold it. That's, that's what he's looking for in our lives. So God is ready to work in his instruments. Are we an instrument of Jesus Christ? Are we willing to let Christ come into our life and to mold us, to make us? Spirit of the living God, mold me, make me, you fill me, use me. Are we willing to do that? You may not be an evangelist. You may not be a pastor, but God will give you the opportunities to tell others about him and about Christ. He will give his people, the, the believers, the ability and courage and power to make ourselves available to God. I know sometimes we, we argue and we see people lifting their hands up when they sing and that kind of thing. And I know that got a bad rap years ago. But as I understand, that's what people are saying. Fill me, use me. And boy, I can do that in my heart if I can't bring myself to do it um, physically. So make yourselves available. And you'll be surprised what God does. He will take your and communicate your caring attitude in, in words that you don't even know you're going to say sometimes. But he'll use your words to communicate, to communicate that you are someone that can be trusted, that, that you are somebody that can be loved. Verse 8. Now, if you think about Paul and you say he's an egotist, like I say, he said that when he was in a group of people or everybody saying, I'm the best, I'm the best, I'm the best. So he said, okay, clowns. And he, he says, in, in, in my words, I must be crazy to be talking like this. But you say this happened to you, this happened to me. He like one-ups them on everything. And I think another time he says, what a fool I am to be saying this. But here's how he really feels about himself. He says that, that he is the least of God's people. Now, that's the direct opposite of the disciples, isn't it? Do you remember the disciples? Who's the greatest? Who can sit at Christ's right hand? 
We see one of those instances in Luke 9, 48, where then Christ said to them, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me, for he who is the least among you all, he is the greatest. Now I do not have proof of this, but God uses people's speech and stuff in an amazing way. And I've always looked at that, okay, Jesus is saying, hey, one of these kids here, a lot less than you, they're the one I'm talking about. But what did Paul call himself? The least of these. And who did Jesus say would be the greatest? The least of these. I think there's a good opportunity that Jesus was talking about Paul. Okay, you say, I don't believe God does that. Well, what about John 11, 50 to 51? These are the words of Caiaphas, the high priest, when they're trying to get rid of Jesus. And, and Caiaphas says, you do not realize, or don't you realize, that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. Heard that before? Yeah, and that makes sense, doesn't it? It's better to, you know, okay, we'll sacrifice this person if you let us alone. I don't know if it's good sense, but we can wrap our head around that. Well, look what verse 51 says. Caiaphas did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. You see that? You see that? God was using Caiaphas of all people. And I think it's a good opportunity that he was talking about Paul there. All right, verse 8, second part of verse 8. He says, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. Think about it. Every, if someone gave you an assignment to tell you of everything you know and write down everything you know about who Jesus Christ is. But one of the things we probably throw our hands up and discuss and say, we can't do this. Do you know the Lord likes to hear that? I was famous of that. My dad had me do it. Well, I was the light guy usually and the runner after, and I didn't know. I always bring the wrong stuff and I shine the light in his eyes. He got furious with me. Um, so, you know, as, as we think of, of that that way, it, and you think of, well, now, unsearchable, that means we can't find an end of it. If you wonder why you think somebody put something in your Bible when you go back through, you've just saw something that you didn't see searching through the last time. So, so it's unsearchable in that way that we're not going to find everything. And the Lord likes us to hear us say, Lord Jesus, what do you want me to say? You know, I, I've seen some in uh, ordination reports or something, who is Jesus? You'd be surprised what some of the would-be preachers say. So if you do that sometime, what, who is Jesus? Okay, number two, only by the grace and mercy of God I'm sorry, only the grace and mercy of God makes it possible for Paul to reveal these secrets, the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ to the Gentile world. The greatest audience that Paul reaches is the Gentiles. It's not that he doesn't try. He goes to Jewish synagogues almost every place he goes ends up getting run out of town usually. And we know he loved them because he said that he would give up his salvation if that meant some of the Jews could be saved. Now that's really saying something, okay? So, but we know that the Jews would believe after a while. Um, you know, because Paul went to the Jews, he was called an imposter. He was called a disruptor. But really, what happened is he preached the truth of the gospel and then the Judaizers came after messing everything up. But there's good evidence that more and more Jewish Christians dropped away from the faith. Historical evidence shows up in an area east of Galilee 
that by the end of the first century, pretty much the people who were Jews and then became believers were gone. And we see it in, in Paul's writings. In, in the book of Hebrews, he says, hey, the law, what you've been doing is good, but here's something better, Jesus Christ. In Galatians, he laments, how are you turning away from me already? I'm meaning God in Christ. You know, we've just been through that. How in the world can you be doing that already? But yet, they were. Another thing that's, when we think about Christ and we think about how unsearchable things are, is that we can spend the rest of our lives digging through Scripture and bring up verses and bring up ideas that we haven't thought of. Now, somebody somewhere has thought about it. You and I aren't going to look at the New Testament and say, there's something no one ever thought of. No. It's been totally revealed. Now, do I all know it all? No. Do you know it all? No. But it's been totally re re revealed. That's what's important about getting Paul's mysteries in there, because that was some of the final revelation that Christ had for us. And that's why they talk about giving the whole gospel because it's the final version. All right, there's something amazing about the Godhead, and we've talked about this before. This time, we're gonna look in Acts 2, 22, 24. And this is about a, a meeting that the Godhead had before time began. It says, people of Israel, listen, God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles and wonders of the remnant of his inheritance. In other words, to the Jews. He came to the Jews, he gave them every opportunity that they could need to see he was Messiah. God helped him out by giving him all these things. And then he says, you do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. Oh my goodness, I jumped, I uh, pinched that off, okay. Okay, um, it says in 23, but God knew what would happen. And his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. Jesus said, Judas, I didn't know. Yes, he did. Uh, next part of 23, with the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. All right, number three kind of encapsulates that. The triune God, that means the Trinity, came together before time began and formed plan A to create planet Earth to be lived on by humans. All right, we know during creation that male and female were made and they knew that Eve would take of the fruit and share it with Adam, and that Adam would say, I want to stay with Eve instead of, of living forever. So we know that that happened, and they created anyway. And as soon as they sinned, as soon as they were hiding, the plan of redemption, blood sacrifice was ready. First, it was animals, and that animal blood did not take the sins away, but it covered the sins. Number four talks about that a little more. Plan A included a redemption that would demand the Lord who called everything into being in the first place to become flesh. You know, Jesus could have said abracadabra shazam and he would have been 30 years old and ready to go into ministry. You know, Adam and Eve, they were created as adults, but they were just created. But this time, God would come as a little baby. Why? Would you trust Christ to know everything you've gone through if he just kind of whizzed in here and then whizzed back out? I don't think we would. But here he came and lived that human life that you and I live. We meet him as a baby. Next time we meet him, he's about 12 years old. And he has gone with his family to the temple, 
And he stayed at the temple and the family didn't realize and they've been looking for him, looking for him. Luke 2, 29 or 49, Jesus says, why were you searching for me? He asked, did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? And you know what it says? It says that Mary and Joseph didn't understand why he said that or what he meant. Now, I don't know, maybe they were cut from it because God did that sometimes, but they did not know or realize what he was saying, who his father was, okay? So the next time we meet him is when his ministry starts. Right after John the Baptist, about six months, they're about six months apart in age, and right about six months before Jesus starts preaching, John starts preaching. And it seems like nobody knows. Certainly Jesus' family didn't. His brothers made fun of him and said, you ought to go down to Jerusalem, you're so hot, and see what they do with you down there. They wanted him to get killed. And, and so even though he didn't sin, people didn't realize who he was. Only Jesus Christ, God through the power of Jesus Christ, as we've been talking about this power, can take a hell-bound sinner and send them to be a heaven-born believer and liver. Verse 9. God's looking for persistence. He says, and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept secret in God who created all things. Okay, God's going to give this secret to Jesus, or, or I'm sorry, to Paul through Jesus. And then Paul is supposed to make it plain. Now think, Saul himself, you know, he had however many years of religious training. He's called himself a Pharisee, a Pharisee. You know, he was rich probably, and he had it all. He had it all, but he, he gave it all up. And he made sure, as close as he could, that everybody found out about it. You know, as I said last week, prisoners, the prison guards, everybody found out about it. So God created all things, a lot of it by just speaking it into existence. He formed a plan A. His plan A is so far somewhere around 6,000 years old. And where are we in God's plan? right where we're supposed to be. All right, verse 10. So through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety, anyone want to argue with that, the wisdom of God, might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in he heavenly places. Huh. You know, this, this, mystery that we talked about last week is that whoever, what color, no matter what, Jews and Gentiles will become one body. The body's going to be made up of anyone who believes in the work of the cross. doesn't matter what we look like, how much weight we have or don't have. Okay? So we understand that. But it's talking about the, the, the heavenly. It's talking about the angels. Talking about the demons. I don't think the demons are in heaven necessarily. They were thrown out of heaven, but they're around. And they're like, I think, taking bets. This is never going to work. This, even the angels are surprised. They say, these people have hated each other for four, five, six thousand years, and you're going to put them all together in one body? But I don't know. It sounds like we're going to get a chance to talk to the angels about it, so keep studying Keep studying so we can be ready. Okay, number six, I think. Yes. God only accepts sinful people because of a sacrifice. I don't mean that, that he only accepts sinful people, but he does. But he, he accepts sinful people because of a sacrifice that removes their sins. Jesus Christ is that sacrifice himself through his death on the cross. I skipped five. I skipped five. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. 
Five is God's mystery. The body of Christ includes believing Jews and Gentiles. And we will let angels know the great and wonderful wisdom of God. And again, verse 11 then tells us that according to his eternal purpose, the purpose we talked about in Acts, which he accomplished in, our, in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Okay, verse 12. In him, through faith in him, we may appropriate, appropriate God with freedom and confidence. I said that wrong. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Number seven, only through faith in Christ are we able to approach a holy God. Now believers can enter directly into God's presence through prayer. If you had the opportunity to meet and greet someone that you really looked up to, sports figure, uh, I don't know what kind of, who might be kind of your heroes, and you, you were going to have a meet and greet, and if you've ever done that, you get all excited and think, boy, I'm going to tell them this and tell them that, and it's kind of, they smile and say, hello, goodbye, and that's about it. But what if, if, if your person said, you know what, I, after I'm done taking pictures here in about 10 minutes, I got all afternoon free. I have nothing to do till the night. I'd like to hang out with you. Would you be interested? Probably so. That's what we have with the Lord God Almighty. And it's not just occasional access. It's not just when we really have something tough on our minds. But His gracious offer gives us great privilege, a great opportunity. It gives us access to the throne room of God. And you imagine, Hebrews 4, 16 says, let us believers therefore come boldly into the throne in grace that we may obtain or gain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. As long as we get there the right hours, right? Now it's 24-7, 365. You and I can approach God. And we can go with freedom and confidence. Religion, sometimes they won't tell you that. Religion sometimes likes to make us jump through hoops and rituals. And give you a list of things that you can do, a list of things that you don't do. The throne room, on the other hand, is always open for believers, no matter what has happened in your life. No matter what you've done, no matter, you know, if you're ashamed of what you've done, no matter what, God is there waiting and ready. It is God's faithfulness that makes everything that you and I enjoy on this earth possible. And you know why we say faithfulness? He will never fail. He has never left us down. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord, our God. And finally, verse 13. Isn't this something? I ask you, therefore, he's talking to the believers, Gentile believers, not to be discouraged because of my suffering for you, which are your glory. Uh, the other day, my phone broke and I took it to get repaired and somehow he didn't get the mic or the speaker hooked up. So I had to take it back and he had glued it pretty good. He's having an awful time getting it apart. And I kept apologizing. I'm saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. but. but <laughs> You know, and he'd say, well, it's not your fault. You know, you didn't do anything. That, that kind of made me think here but that uh, he, he's like being uh, proactive on this. He says, don't feel bad. Don't feel bad when you hear that I'm prison or when you hear that I 
die. It's, it's kind of like a, a, a mother, I guess, having childbirth, and Nancy surely seemed to be having terrific pain. And soon after the birth, the, the pain was kind of gone. I kind of secretly wondered, I wonder if we'll have any more children, because she got mad at me one time. You know, I kept saying, breathe, 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 and blah, blah, and give me a whack. You know, so. But, you know, she was, after a while, she was able to do, uh, go through that again three more times. And, and that's kind of what, what Paul's saying. Don't feel bad about that. It's not your fault. You don't have to worry about them. It, it reminds me of, of Jesus saying, Father, forgive them. You know, Paul might be thinking, if I didn't preach the gospel, I wouldn't be in jail. So that's proof that I preached the gospel. And he also might be thinking about um, it's for those people's good. If you're able to say something, if God uses you to say the right words or, or make a, an impact that someone comes to the Lord, I'm sure some of you have experienced that and it's pretty special. So Paul gladly bore that pain and persecution to bring new babies to God. And when I say that, I'm not belittling people, but they're babes in Christ when they come to him. Obeying Christ is never easy, and we know that he says, pick up your cross and follow me. Number nine, believers feel blessed that others suffered and sacrificed for us so that we might reap the benefit of eternal life. Who is it that sacrificed for you? Who is it that, that introduced you to Christ? As you go out from here, being the one to share, maybe, be willing to endure pain so that God's message of salvation can reach the entire world. Do you remember the disciples went from scared little critters to rejoicing that they had got beaten, that they had been considered close enough to Jesus and understanding him enough that they beat him? We need to understand that the Creator God is completely in control. And number 10, Paul also understood that God was working His will even through His imprisonments and sufferings. Remember this truth and be grateful. I don't know how many people I've heard when something bad's going on in their life, okay, Lord, what do you want me to learn? Oh, that we might all say that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to learn more from your word. And we've not looked at, at all of Paul's qualities, and I'm not trying to lift him up as Superman or anything, but he just, he was willing to be used. He was willing to be a tool of Christ. And he did what, what you asked. You know, you think of, of Jonah saying yes and going the other way, and, and different people in the Bible who, uh, kind of said they would do what you wanted and didn't follow through. Not, not so with Saul. And again, I can't imagine the amount of grace and power it took to knock that Judaism out of his head and understand that something different was going to rule his life. And I think he battled with it sometimes. He said, the things I don't want to do, I do. The things I want to do, I don't. So I think he understood that. Lord, if there's anyone here that is would like to dedicate, or, or listening, that would like to dedicate their life to you, that, to put you in charge. I pray that they get a hold of us one way or another. Call, call, stop in, whatever. We would love to talk to you, explain more about Jesus. I pray, Lord, that, that us here today, the ones that are here today, that your words would burn in our bones, that we got to let them out. We, got, when we say sometimes, I can't take this anymore when it's external stuff going on. Wouldn't that be great to say, I can't take this because there's internal stuff going on and wanting to get out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last song is, Oh Jesus, I've Promised, number 589. If you can stand, please stand.
How many of you like to be in a minority? To be the minority? I like to be the majority. Do you? We with Jesus are a majority, no matter what the issue. Not Jesus with us. <laughs> us with Jesus. May you enjoy and thrive in that kind of majority. And all God's people say. Just kind of break from here. <laughs> if anybody wants to talk to each other, it's probably best outside, but you can talk in here too if you want.